Okay, so we have the pleasure to have uh, Ana Lacerda from the Portuguese Institute of Cancer in, uh, in Portugal. She's a pediatric oncologist, but uh, with a master in, uh, in uh, palliative care, so we will discuss about palliative care uh, with a uh, uh, lecture. Okay, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm also here because I'm the chair of the SIOP Palliative Care Working Group that was uh, created uh, last year. So I have nothing uh, of, uh, of a conflict to declare except that I'm passionate about palliative care. So, and I also want to tell you that the presentation and uh, any papers or documents that I will be citing will be made available to you after the session, as well as the slides and also the uh, documents that we used in the palliative care working group uh, sessions before it, they will made, be made available uh, for everyone to, um, to really uh, use them uh, later. So for something completely different, no uh, molecular profiling and no clinical <laughs> trials now, uh, but most of you are probably still feeling like this about uh, palliative care, so hopefully, uh, by the end of uh, this session, and if you uh, uh, get interested in palliative care, you will change your minds, hopefully. So I would like to start with a very a brief introduction about palliative care, because I was asked to use this hour to, um, to talk about uh, two specific uh, and important aspects of, of palliative care, which are uh, pain control and palliative sedation. So we will do that using two cases, but a really short introduction that is really uh, needed, I guess. So this is one of the latest definitions of palliative care. And I think that I've uh, put in, in bold some of the most um, important aspects of this definition. And there is a word that you don't see there, which is death. So we really have to uh, bring ourselves away from the concept that palliative care is for people who are dying. It is, of course, for people, for children who are dying in our case, but it's especially for all people that are suffering, and that is the patients, that's their families, their caregivers, and ultimately it's also about us. I really believe that um, learning about palliative care and using palliative care principles in our daily lives as pediatric oncologists really does help us in our uh, work in what we uh, do. So why talk about palliative care in pediatric oncology? Well, because really, as I said, no molecular profiling and no early clinical trials. It's very easy to forget that this is about people. It's people we are dealing with. Have you read this book? Yeah. It's mandatory reading, right? So those of you who haven't have to go home and buy a copy and make it for a summer vacation lecture because it's really worthwhile. You learn a lot about oncology, about pediatric oncology, uh, and about why we need palliative care uh, in our lives. And uh, this is uh, what happens daily. We see the right part of the slide. We see the illness and all the, uh, all the tests and all the, the imaging and everything and the prognosis and this and that. And the families see, uh, see, see that, but they also see all the burdens and all the uncertainties and all the uh, loss of control that this cancer diagnosis is going to represent for their child and, uh, and for them as well. So this is why um, the disease experience is really so important. Because in, in Europe, a developed region of the world, still one out of every five children diagnosed with cancer will, will die from the disease, more or less. But the problem is that in most cases, we do not know which one is going to be. Of course, before we were just discussing the high-grade glioma, so it's most likely that that child will die after a more or, long, more or less long period, after a honeymoon period. But sometimes even children with a good prognosis situation will die because of an unexpected uh, turnaround yeah. of, the, um, of the disease. So we don't know. 
And uh, I took this uh, phrase from uh, one of our Bibles, so the principles and practice of pediatric oncology. And what the authors of the chapter on palliative care tell us is if death is a potential outcome, we really should be in involving palliative care much earlier than the end of life. So if it's a possibility, we should think about involving palliative care. And um, we also, we, we know this, but we sometimes forget that the, a chronic illness like cancer is, uh, children often go through this disease roller coaster, even the child with a high-grade glioma, because as I said before, they will have the, the honeymoon uh, period, so, oh, sorry. Um, um, they will, sorry, flip. They will uh, improve, whoops, can't really use this. They will uh, be ill, then they will improve a little bit after the initial treatment, the surgery and the radiotherapy, and then they will start to deteriorate again, maybe some ups and downs, but ultimately uh, this child will, uh, will die. So we have to remember this, and that this trajectory, what, what it means is that families will have renewed hope at some times, and then there is a turnaround and things get dismal again. So um, another important idea is that either the child, if the child dies or survives, the needs of the family and the child are the same from the beginning. So they need uh, to have hope in something. They, he, they need to have a meaning for what's happening to them. They really do need a lot of support, not just for, the, for the, the disease, the physical aspects of the disease, but for all the emotional, spiritual, uh, psychosocial, everything that's around the, the, the cancer diagnosis. And then, of course, uh, uh, towards the end of the cancer journey, if it's survivorship or if it's, uh, if it's death, then the needs will be different, of course. But in, at the beginning, they will be the same. So palliative care, pediatric palliative care, is, of course, about a good death. That's one of the mainstays of, of palliative care. But I would say that it's mostly about a good life, having a good life throughout the, the, the disease, in this case, the, the, the cancer uh, journey because we cannot yet cure cancer, but we can certainly help our, um, our families have less uh, distress. And I told you uh, last year, SIOP created the palliative care working group, and in Valencia, just a month ago, we had a session on early versus late palliative care, and we prepared uh, this flyer that uh, I believe has been sent to all participants before uh, this uh, course. Um, and we are also looking for uh, translations into different uh, European languages. So if, if you think that you can help us, uh, send us an email. And I would just like to highlight this. Early palliative care, so earlier than uh, end of life, allows for more time to plan and to provide the best possible support for the entire family along the cancer journey and whatever the outcome. These are the five key pillars of palliative care. Communication, family support, shared informed decision making, advanced care planning, and symptom management. So today we are going to be talking a little bit about symptom management. And I just want to tell you as a fun fact that uh, this is where the name palliative, uh, the, the word comes from, because the idea was that if you cannot cure a symptom, uh, then you disguise it. And it comes from the Latin palliare, which is to cover with a cloak. So, hence palliative care. I hope our Italian friends agree with us. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so for the first case, we have a three-year-old boy just diagnosed with a stage four uh, neuroblastoma. He has a uh, very large, quite large, you can see um, the MIBG um, uh, scan here. Uh, an ab uh, abdominal unresectable uh, primary. He has bone marrow and bone invasion. He just had a CVC placed for starting chemotherapy, of course. He has pain eight out of 10. It's uh, the, the first thing to do, right? It's to evaluate the pain. And he's vomiting and he weighs 50, 15 kilos. So remember this for later. So first question, why does this child have pain? It's easy. 
Come on. Because he has disease, right? Sorry. Someone. Inflammation as well? Inflammation, certainly, but that due to disease, right? Compression due to the tumor. Yeah, compression due to the tumor. The metastasis, of course, so it's all, it's mixed, so the illness, right? Why else? Why? More reasons for him to have pain. Have you ever had a CVC placed? Sorry? Anxiety, is, is that a reason for him to have pain? Yeah, it is. Yeah, hospitalization, yeah. Actually, this child was like 300 kilometers away from his home and in a place that uh, he doesn't know anyone, right? It's everything uh, is new, yeah. So you got it right. So the mass, of course, it's a large uh, mass. Uh, compression and everything, he's vomiting too. Uh, the bone and bone marrow metastasis, of course, that's uh, also a reason for having pain. He just had a CVC placed. He, went, he had to go to the OR and now there is a foreign body there. Uh, he's vomiting too, so that's not helping. But as Andashi pointed out, he's also sad and he's afraid, right? So these are all re reasons for him to be in pain, to have such a high level of pain. And uh, we know <laughs> that in um, advanced cancer, pain is not only the most frequent um, symptom, but it's also the most distressing symptom because we can have a, sim a symptom and not be suffering from it. But in this case, it's there and it's distressing. And uh, the, the child's suffering is for sure going to impact on the family's uh, well-being as well. So it's going to cause uh, family uh, distress. And what I want to tell you here is that um, there are four dimensions recognized for chronic pain. It's of course the physical, but also social, spiritual, and emotional. That's why it's so important to recognize that this child also has pain because he's afraid and because he's anxious. And so this was, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry that the color, it's, it's quite light there. Uh, this is, was a concept that was uh, coined by Dame Cicely Saunders. She is like the, modern, the mother of modern palliative care. And she coined this term, total pain, encompassing all these four dimensions. So a total pain demands what? A total approach, of course. So we have to address all these dimensions. So having said this, how do we treat this child's pain? What are we going to do to treat his pain? Offer painkillers. Pain <laughs> okay, very good. Do you care to elaborate on that? Which painkillers? Who said painkillers? Because because of the light, I can't really see. Very sorry. Uh, so morphine. So morphine. So that's a light or a strong painkiller. It's a strong pain he killer. Strong pain. He has a strong pain. <laughs> very good. <laughs> no, this is, this, is, this is very important, and we will discuss it uh, in a few moments. What else besides painkillers? Starting his chemotherapy. Starting chemotherapy. Very good, of course. That's also part of treating his pain. Yeah. Allow parents to be close to him so he, has a, he can see a familiar face. Very good, very good. That's important too, of course. Uh, so uh, play therapy and psychological support? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Making him feel uh, at home, comfortable in the, the hospital, not being so afraid, yeah. He can help to manage his um, other symptoms that are distressing him, like the nausea and vomiting, make sure he's well hydrated, he might need fluids, all those yeah. things might make him more comfortable. Yes. All that is right. Causing hope within the family that he will be cured, or although it's a stage four neuroblastoma. Um, causing, causing, hope oh, hope of cure. Oh, okay. it's stage four. Yes. Is that important too? Yes. yes. 
it's, it's important. So the truth is that, as I said, total pain, total approach. <laughs> so this is, I'm sure you cannot read the, the small uh, lettering, but this is just to, to, to tell you that, uh, and yesterday we were talking about integrative medicine and how import, important it is uh, becoming also in, in pediatric oncology or especially in pediatric oncology, and that's absolutely true. We do need several approaches and several um, interventions to this uh, child's pain. And of course, painkillers is, is very important, but that's not the only thing that we can do. Everything you said, uh, starting the chemo, uh, the play therapy, um, making the parents uh, um, feel um, more comfortable and um, having hope about this child uh, being uh, uh, cured. Uh, so all that is important to treat this child's pain. And uh, I want to tell you that uh, in your folder that will be sent to you later, uh, you will find these three documents uh, that are very, very important uh, about uh, uh, pain control in, in children. And there is an app called Orthodose that you can also download to your uh, smartphones, and that will help you prescribe the painkillers that we are going to talk about uh, in uh, uh, a little while. So, the, but the first step in treating chronic pain is recognizing it, but because sometimes, believe it or not, uh, some doctors still do not recognize pain. They will, um, they will not, uh, they will say that it's not important. What is important, you know, it's, uh, it's the cancer and, or it's the vomiting or something else. And pain, oh, it's, it's not that bad. It's not that strong. We don't need strong painkillers uh, for, for this child. And uh, as uh, already said, reassuring uh, the parents, this is really important. And I, I really like this um, uh, campaign from, from Canada. Acting calm keeps kids calm. So we really have to work also with the parents uh, to help control uh, this child's pain. And of course, I've said it before, don't forget to evaluate and to reevaluate the pain. There are a lot of scales that we can use, even with small children. So I particularly like the, the Lego faces uh, pain scale here, but it's just, just an idea. And everyone uh, already knows the WHO principles for the treatment of uh, chronic pain, but just to remind us, uh, by the letter, by the mouth, so preferably using the oral route, by the child, so we really have to get to uh, know that child and that child's pain, and by the clock. So everyone knows this, right? Uh, there, is the, um, there is the pain ladder, one, two, three steps, and then uh, we can add a fourth and a fifth step. So these um, last uh, two steps are usually, uh, usually require the intervention or more, of uh, more specialized uh, teams because we don't deal with this every day and we're gonna need um, the help from our uh, colleagues in, in other, um, in other uh, oh, sorry, in other, um, in other teams. Unfortunately, uh, there's still a lot of uh, opioid phobia about using uh, strong uh, opioids. And uh, as I said, but e even if you don't deal with pain every day, don't be uh, afraid or ashamed to ask for help from the people uh, on the pain team or on the palliative care team at your hospital because they're there to help you uh, navigate uh, this. So let's just look at the first three steps. So how do we use these three steps? So what do we do? We start here and then we go and we move up. How do we do it? I think we, 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 not all of us have the same level of accepting pain. So you have to coordinate the treatment according to the patient's limits. Yeah, but that's why 
I said the first step is to evaluate the pain. It's, it's just not, or it shouldn't be just looking at the child and saying, mm, it's a light pain, a medium pain, a strong pain. No, we should be asking, and there are scales for that, and even, you can use, even use scales with nonverbal children, and uh, there are like subjective um, scales. So the f that's the first step, absolutely, is evaluating the pain. But then how do we use the scale, the, um, the ladder? Do we have, to, my question is, do we have to go step by step? No. No, yeah, that's a very common misconception. And that's why also WHO is reviewing the concept of the ladder. Because many people think, uh, because this is a ladder, we cannot uh, jump steps. We have to start here and then go to the other step and then only then to, to, the, to the last step. So, but that's not true. So what, uh, how should we do this? So if we have a light pain, which is a pain that scores less than three out of 10, we are going to be using uh, non-opioids and the adjuvants, you, you can uh, see that they're, they're always there. We can always choose to use the adjuvants. But so the keystone is gonna be non-opioids, paracetamol and non-inflammatory, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. What I wanna tell you here <coughs> is that these drugs have a ceiling effect, okay? So there are some, uh, there is a maximum dose that we can use. And we should also never combine uh, NSAIDs. So we should not be giving ibuprofen plus diclofenac or something like that. We can use paracetamol and ibuprofen, but not to non-steroidals um, at the same time. And then we have moderate to severe pain. Moderate is four to seven and severe is eight to 10. And here, what we're gonna do is we can use everything, okay? But also, in 2011, one of those documents that I showed, I showed you, uh, WHO uh, cautioned us against the use of uh, the, the so-called weak opioids, tramadol and codeine, in children. What they said is that the benefit-risk ratio is, is not favorable to the use of these drugs in children. So they uh, put out a word of caution uh, in using this um, in the pediatric age group. So very often you will see uh, an escalator from non-opioids to uh, strong opioids and just forget about step two um, uh, and don't, don't use these uh, weak opioids uh, in children. So the way uh, we should treat chronic pain is like this. We have to consider that the child has a baseline pain, which is in this case is an eight out of 10 right? So for treating the baseline pain, we are going to use baseline medication, something that we are going to give at regular intervals. It's not uh, SOS or PRN, not when he has pain. We have to give it at regular intervals, every eight hours, every 12 hours, every 24. It will depend on the drug and the formulation that you choose. So the, the, the key idea here is that these medications are going to have a long half-life, so at least eight hours, and also a slow onset of action. But then uh, this child will have uh, breakthrough pain and sometimes even incident pain. So the, there's a difference. Breakthrough through pain, we can uh, anticipate that it's gonna happen. Like if a child is, uh, is uh, bedridden, for instance, and he has a lot of pain, like in this case, because he has bone metastasis, uh, he's gonna have pain changing position or uh, having uh, his bath. So we know that this is gonna, uh, going to happen. So we are going to give him rescue medication. And because we know it's gonna happen, we can give the, or we should give this medication 20 to 30 minutes before he has his bath or before he's changed moved from the bed to a chair or whatever it is that we know that we are going, we are doing and is gonna induce pain. So these rescue medications have a short half-life. It again varies with the drug and the formulation that we're choosing, but
but they do have a rapid onset of action, usually around 15 to 20 minutes. That's why it's important to, to think about this beforehand. Now, with incident pain, it's pain that comes out of nowhere. All of a sudden, the, the child will start you know, crying because there's just there's pain. Usually, it's like very, very strong. And here, what we have to do is, again, to give rescue medication. But we can't wait 15 or 20 minutes for the drug to kick in. So we have to choose a formulation that has an ultra-short half-life. But the problem is, um, I'm sorry, that has an ultra-rapid onset of action. The problem is that it comes with an ultra-short half-life. So it will, uh, it's like, I'm, I'm thinking like a, a intranasal fentanyl. It will start in one minute or half a minute but then it will all also only last for like five to 10 minutes. So some people will advise you to give uh, the ultra rapid onset of action uh, drug, but at the same time, give one of those um, uh, rapid onset of actions and short half-life medication, because then you will cover uh, a longer period um, of, um, of pain control. Okay, so give a quick very quick uh, one minute control, but given something else to, that will kick in when the other is, is uh, already um, declining the, the, the effect, but it, it will kick in and it will cover the, the child's pain for a little bit uh, longer. So again, we come to the, <laughs> to the question. So how are we going to treat this child's pain? Can I also you said ask it. something? Sure. Sure. I also have a question, Anna. Sure. I wonder for the fentanyl, um, are you easy at prescribing it? Because I, I'm always afraid that uh, I won't get the children off the fentanyl nose spray. I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand. For the fentanyl, do you <laughs> easily prescribe it? Because I'm, I'm often afraid that if I give the children a fentanyl nose spray, that they don't want to give it back. <laughs> 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 well, that's that, that's a good question, Reinecke. And um, the, there's a problem with uh, with some of the formulations, and that's specifically why I chose not to to talk about uh, specific uh, drugs and formulations, because it will depend a lot um, on not only on the countries, because it might not be available in all countries, and also the dosing. It's most times not adequate for small children. So you can only use because of the dosing that's available in, in older children. And that is a problem, uh, especially with, with teenagers. Yes, so we have to be careful about that. Yeah, so we have to think about this. Uh, what I, I'll tell you what I don't like, um, IV boluses. I can deal with the, IV, with the intranasal fentanyl and I can deal with the transmucosal fentanyl IV boluses. I have it harder. <laughs> so, but but it's 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 tricky. So, how do we treat this pain? Just you know the, the basics. Not. You've said it before. I'll 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 help. So we start CT, right? And we talk to the family, and we give them support, right? But we need, we need drugs. <laughs> this is not enough. So what drugs are we going to give him? Just give a turn to someone. What yeah. will you do? Uh, at the beginning, I guess start with the light ones, uh, light analgetics with maybe paracetamol or or maybe the, the group uh, ibuprofen. And if that doesn't help, then, then it depends on uh, how, how uh, what is the, is it a severe pain or the stage of the pain? Does everyone give ibuprofen, by the way? No. Actually, we would give continuously morphine. Yeah. So you would give uh, I'm not talking about formulations yet, just, so you would give a strong opioid, right? Um, yeah, so we, we'd probably give, we'd probably give, well, it would depend about about what the child was like. We'd start, ke chemotherapy would help, definitely. Um, and then we'd probably give regular oromorph, plus or minus paracetamol, depending on what 
the count was sometimes sometimes we don't use paracetamol regularly just because patients don't go home with it ge in general because of concerns about fibronychopenia and so it's a unit thing that sometimes we don't like to give paracetamol regularly it, it varies yeah. and then if it was if they tolerate the oral morph and they're on a reasonable dose we'd probably switch them to a fentanyl patch um if the pain wasn't controlled we'd probably put them on a on pump you know a nurse controlled analgesia with either morphine and ketamine usually something like that and then the pain team now have actually started using clonidine patches quite a lot so probably something like that is what we'd go with yeah Let, let's try to keep it simple <laughs> because um i we have to recognize that not all, not all um departments will have uh pcas uh, so patient-controlled analgesia pumps available and pain teams and everything. So uh, what I'm really trying to, to pass on to you is how we can do it ourselves, right? But yes? Ourselves as in the doctors in stress because he's in pain or? Uh? I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you said to deal with ourselves like as in the treating physician or <laughs> what we would do? First, I would ask what he's been given before, so I know what works. Probably he's been given something at home. Maybe the parents know what works for him. And because of the vomiting and nausea, I would give something that is not peros because that wouldn't go in. And I would start because the pain seems very intense. I would start with intense medication, and but also talk to the parents and explain that to them because mm -hmm. I want the kid in, yeah. in conscious. So well, it yeah, it's, uh, you just said something that's very important because um, just to, to, to move uh, forward, um, we should give a strong opioid, right? And some possibilities here. It will depend, of course, on, on the setting and on the child and on the child's size and if there's a line in place and this and that. But you just said something important because sometimes we say, oh, we're going to give morphine to your child. And the parents are going to go like, oh, my God, my child is dying, right? Because morphine is only for people who are, who are dying. So that's, that's very important. So what I think are the keystones would be a strong opioid round the clock. Don't forget because we need to cover his baseline pain, which is 8 out of 10. And SOS. We need to have SOS. Um, I would think about giving a non-steroid non anti-inflammatory drug because of the bone pain, because uh, that's probably going to be helping a little bit or maybe even a lot. And that uh, is something called an opioid sparing strategy. So it, it will probably help us not having to use such high doses of, of a strong opioid, which can have, can have um, adverse events and, uh, and be quite sedative also. And if we decide to use uh, a non-steroidal or paracetamol, of course, we have to be careful. And someone said already, be, uh, because we have to look out for, for the fever and everything else. Um, but if we decide to give it, it should be given round the clock also because we are treating the baseline uh, pain. And the SOS is going to be a strong opioid again and not one of the other, one of the drugs in the other. Questions I have. Sure. Oh, sure. Short question. Could you also comment on metamizol in, an, in the opioid sparing strategy because it's not here? Yeah, well, it's a non steroidal anti inflammatory drug and we do use it. Uh, with some concern as well, but it's something that that was that's one of my other questions. What is going to be our chosen or preferred route of administration here? Intravenous, right? Okay, yeah, because he's vomiting. Because he's vomiting. And he has a line in place, so we got to take advantage of that, of course. But if the setting were different, remember, he's three, three years old. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, but the, so we, we always have to look at the child and the setting and what what's there for us to to use. So there is no absolute uh, answer. Oh, I'm sorry. So you talk a lot about uh, NSA, but uh, in the setting of chemotherapy, so now I know we're acute, we just start with chemotherapy, but uh, I'm not sure if I'm the only one thinking like this, but uh, I thought like in the setting of chemotherapy, we try to avoid them. Yeah, we try to avoid them. Especially when, when yeah. platelets are low and everything, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. yeah, but that 
you, you said you used the verb, try to avoid, right? So I'm not saying that we're going to use uh, NSAIDs for a, a week or for five days or whatever, but maybe the first day he had his line uh, in, uh, in, uh, in place and he does have a lot of pain from the bone metastasis, so maybe for 24 hours or so we can use uh, metamizole, IV metamizole. So, but not uh, on a long uh, course. Um, it's, I think it's I'm interesting sorry. that you can hear the differences between countries because yep. apparently some people don't give baricetamol because of spiking fever. Uh, some other countries like ours, we yep. don't give uh, NSAIDs at all. Yep. Uh, so it's interesting. There's yep. probably lots of differences. There is, there is. And um, I think it, um, one of the, um, the things that we, uh, in, in my department, <laughs> that we say always uh, to the parents and to the nurses is never give paracetamol without checking the temperature uh, first. And we really try to keep, if we decide that the child will benefit from using metamizole or ibuprofen, keep it very, very short, you know, just to control uh, that situation uh, um, a day or something like that, not, you know, not, uh, not a, a long course. So using strong opioids, these are some of the things that I really want to, 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 to tell you. So there are several formulations, several um, ways of uh, administration, and again, we have to, you have to learn in your country uh, which formulations you have available, and you have to learn the dosings, and you have to, to learn how to, how to work with, with that. Uh, we must not forget that using a strong opioid is associated with several adverse events, and uh, the most common uh, are, of course, uh, constipation and somnolence. Nausea is also important in, uh, in uh, children, and uh, very importantly, uh, one of the fears about using uh, um, strong opioids is the fear of respiratory depression. But the truth is, if we use it right, if we know what we are doing, if we start low, and uh, if we ask for help when we don't, when we don't know, um, it's not going to happen because that child is in pain, so that child is not going to die from respiratory depression. If nothing else, his pain will keep him breathing. Uh, another important thing is, and it's already, it's another myth about uh, using strong opioids, is um, that uh, there's child, children will, are going to develop addiction. So we just spoke about this, about uh, uh, intranasal uh, fentanyl, and I agree, we, we cannot leave the, the spray with them, uh, but it, it, it can and should be used when, uh, uh, when needed. And uh, another important message here is that there is no dose limit because uh, patients can develop tolerance and so they will keep um, needing uh, increasing doses of the, of the drugs um, that we are uh, using. So uh, we must also prescribe, when we prescribe a strong opioid, uh, a laxative, uh, an anti-emetic. We're probably going to need it for the first 24, 48 hours. May then maybe we're, we are not going to need it. But um, as someone pointed out, this child is vomiting. So he's also going to need that because he, he is uh, vomiting. If we choose to, to use uh, a non-steroidal, um, we, uh, we should also remember to use gastric protection because they're going to need it too. And there's a, there could be another discussion about which drug to use, which route to use, so not going to go there. So in those uh, documents that you uh, will have available, you will find these tables with uh, all the recommended dosings and equivalent doses between morphine and, uh, and uh, fentanyl, because uh, fentanyl is really very useful, especially when you think of uh, sending the child home and you want to change from an IV route to, uh, uh, to another route and especially the transdermal uh, uh, route uh, of uh, fentanyl. So what are we going to prescribe to this uh, child? We said we are going to uh, do morphine continuous IV, right? Someone said that. I can't remember. I think it was you. So the way we do it uh, in my department, and if you had read the small letterings in the other tables, uh, so we multiply the weight, 15 kilos, by 0.6 milligrams. So that's the daily dose per kilo. 
So 0.6 times 15, it's nine milligrams. We dilute it in up to 48 cc's of normal saline and we prescribe it at two mLs per hour. Uh, why two mLs? You can choose something else. You can choose 120 and five mLs, whatever. We like to do it because uh, these children um, have probably other IV fluid um, requirements. So we, we try not to overload. And also, why not one? <laughs> because with two, it's easier for us, and especially in smaller kids and in opioid naive patients, so someone who has never had a strong opioid, sometimes we will not start with the two mLs. We will prescribe it like this, but we will start with the one mL per hour, and then we will build up slowly, okay? It's better to always start, start low and then uh, build it up. Don't forget to also prescribe the SOS uh, boluses, okay? So the boluses, again, start low. So 0 0.05 times 15 kilos, about 0 0.75, mm -hmm. more or less. Uh, and this can be given um, every 15 minutes until relief of the pain. And it should be given at the beginning of the, of the infusion. Uh, may sure. I ask you, how long will you wait to escalate from 1 ml to 2 ml per hour? If we... So, so it's like a couple of hours, it's one day, we two see, days? No, or? no, no, no. Uh, actually, I wrote the next day at all SOS. No, but we start, let's say, we start the, the morphine IV now. And uh, next uh, hour, uh, in an hour from now, the nurse will call you and say, the patient is not comfortable and he's had already two uh, boluses. Then I will say, go up. Don't wait for that, okay? Um, but anyway, the next day, usually it's the next day, we should add all the boluses that were given for incident pain, and we try to cover the incident pain. So we add, for instance, let's imagine this child had six boluses. So six times 0.75, that's 4.5. We will add that to the nine milligrams, and this will be the new daily dose for that child. Okay. Anna, may I ask? And don't forget, let me, let me just finish this. And don't forget to, to also increase the boluses, okay? So we need to increase, to increase the, two, um, the two prescriptions, the continuous IV, but also the PRN boluses. Yes, Ronica. And do you start with uploading, I guess, with a higher dose? Yes, yeah, yeah. I said, um, no, we start with a bolus. Okay, just an hour's bolus, not higher. No, we, we start with the bolus and we give the bolus every 10, 15 minutes until the child is, um, is comfortable. Yes. Is that clear? Sorry. Sure. Uh, we have the habit that with incident cases that we come for that, that we um, upscale the dose with 25%. After yeah, you, you can do it uh, in many different ways. Some some people in my department, some people will also write, uh, and I don't I don't think that this is wrong. Uh, if the child uh, after two boluses increase the infusion by 0.1 mLs per hour, you can do this too. Yeah, I, I think the most important is that you get comfortable with prescribing this and really get the feeling. And you, you have to know the child too, as I said. Be careful if it's a small child and be careful if it's a naive, an opioid naive child, okay? But you, you have to, you should prescribe it. You should not be afraid of, of strong uh, opioids. So don't forget also a laxative. Don't forget this from day one. Don't wait until constipation uh, is uh, installed. Uh, probably IV metoclopramide, and we may think about uh, the IV uh, non-steroidal drug and uh, gastric uh, protection. Adjuvants. Are we going to need adjuvants for this uh, child? We could um, maybe uh, think about it. Uh, you have here the list of uh, adjuvants that uh, uh, can be used. Um, bone pain. Um, biphosphonates have been shown to be uh, helpful. Uh, as for steroids, everyone uses them, but there is really no good evidence that they work. But um, many people use them. 
So what's recommended is an N of 1. So you try, and if it helps your patient, then uh, you use it. If not, uh, make it uh, uh, the course as short as possible, just four or five days until the chemo kicks in and everything, and the child is feeling better, then you, you take out uh, the, um, uh, the steroids. So maybe we could think about IV dexamethasone for this child, uh, maybe a sublingual benzodiazepine is a little bit small, but or something else that we could, that we could try for his uh, anxiety and that maybe could help. Um, I want to tell you that maybe the dexamethasone is already being used as part of the anti-emetic regimen, okay? So we, we are not adding uh, another dose. Yes? You, you talk uh, rightly about benzodiazepine. Yes. Uh, would you try maybe before uh, some kind of antihistaminicum? Uh, yeah. Or not? You, you, because you, you can do that too. Yes, it depends on the child. This is a three-year-old, yeah. so maybe some uh, um, hydroxyzine. Because for, for like us, that. it's more a problem of education yeah. and especially education of the nurses. Mm -hmm that I have seen on our department that ask then the interns to prescribe very easily benzo benzodiazepine. And then it's very difficult to, to educate that in such a small child, it's maybe not the best idea. Yeah. yeah. I don't you're, know what's your point yeah. on that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I just put uh, their uh, benzodiazepines thinking about the anxiety, but you're right. For this child, hydroxyzine might be um, a, good, uh, a good choice, though there could be also some paradoxical agitation. We don't know, but N of one, again. So we try and this, we see what, um, what works for the, for the child. But just the idea is, that is really don't forget to address all of these aspects of pain control in this child. So then we have two scenarios, pain improves. So what do we do? The pain is improving. It's not having, it's not requiring six boluses anymore. No boluses. Yep, Charles? So um, um, I would switch his IV morphine to, to oral, oral morphine, and then titrate downwards as needed. But you're going to titrate after, ch after changing? Well, I mean, it depends on if he's already on a high dose of IV, titrate that down. If he's already on the lowest dose, then I'd switch over to oral and then titrate. Um, it, it, is, it is the right answer, anyway. <laughs> so um, what I wrote here is, uh, because this child is still in a hospital, so if the pain improves, is on IV, continuous IV morphine, reduce the infusion slowly. Remember that, slowly. You cannot just stop it like that, especially if you've uh, gone up to a, to a, to a high uh, dose. So uh, reduce it slowly. Again, uh, what we usually say to the nurses is uh, every shift or every four hours, you decrease it by 0.1 or by 0.2. Or, and then go back to the previous uh, um, rhythm if the child develops pain. So don't forget that because it, it can be also uh, an up and down uh, process. And what if the child has finished his chemo, is feeling much better, but there is still some pain. So what do we do? Charles was right. We need to change to another uh, uh, formulation, right? So how do we do that? So we can change to oral morphine, right? Which, again, can be a bit tricky in this three-year-old who weights uh, 15 kilos. So that's why you really need to know the formulations that you have available uh, in your countries. So changing to oral morphine, we take the daily IV dose and we have to multiply by two or three. So we, we have to find a, a number in between that fits the available formulations that we have. And we are going to choose a slow release formulation. And these usually have a 12 hour half-life. So that they have to be given twice in the morning and in the evening. Plus do not forget that we need to also prescribe uh, rapid release rescue. And these usually have a four uh, hour half-life. So if this child was having 13.5 milligrams IV per day, PO that would be somewhere between 27 to 40.5. So you look at the formulations you have available and you see 
what you are going to prescribe. I'm telling you it's tricky because there are, in this case, it's, it would be tricky because there are uh, only um, morphine, uh, slow release morphine pills with um, 10 milligrams, 30 milligrams, and then 60 and 100. So it's quite tricky. Yes. Well, yes. Yes, thank so you. I'm saying out loud, maybe so I'm that's the other. So that's the other. But I wanted to give you the two options, right? Uh, so yes. So for this child, most probably what we would do is change him to a transdermal fentanyl patch. Also because the patches they are available in uh, several um, um, milligrams, several um, presentations, and you can cut the patches. Um, in the beginning, you could not cut the patches because the drug companies would not ensure that the distribution of the drug was the same across the patch, but now you can. You can take a patch and you can cut it half, thirds, fourths, whatever, and you can, you can uh, uh, use that. Again, don't forget that when the child goes home, the baseline and the rescue, the rapid release. So we usually use the Oromorph uh, drops, which are very easy to, to, to use. So, yeah, may, may that I, is it. May, may I ask one it? thing sure. about um, the last case? Because in my experience, these neuroblastoma children tend to present very agitated, painful, mm -hmm. alarming. So in, in a couple of time, you see the pain also improving due to the chemotherapy, yeah. what works in. And although I totally agree with the appropriate pain management and if necessary with the, the, the strategy, but I miss a bit of the, well, I'm a bit surprised of the anxiety about paracetamol because I think in most of these patients where the pain is improving, I could, well, imagine that you go home without any opioids. So yeah, my experience, could. so yeah. I think paracetamol is very mm -hmm. strong, yeah. good painkiller. So yeah. that was one. Well, thank you for pointing <laughs> that out <laughs> because yeah. I, I really thought we were focusing this on strong opioids because I don't think people are afraid to use paracetamol, but are still afraid to use strong opioids. But you're absolutely right. So we have to look at the level, at, at the pain level. That's why it's important to evaluate it. And again, light pain, you can use, you should use paracetamol and uh, moderate to severe pain go to strong opioids. But thank you for... And, um, and may I ask yeah. one other sure. thing? Because... Um, in the previous hospital I worked, we used a lot of metamizole, not in mm -hmm. the oncology ward, but mainly in the children ward, but it's not still not registered. And it's still having a problem with the name of the granulocytic problems, the agranulosis. So yeah. it would be amazing because it's much better. It doesn't have the kidney side effects. So if we could use it, I think we would have better pain management. But so it's a question of whether we as a community can drive it towards the registration and really know whether we can use it or not. Because it remains yeah. in our institution now very much of a discussion. And currently it's not used due to the potential side effects. Yeah. But I don't know what the current practice in other institutions is. What is this drug? I'm, I'm it's an NSIDA without the side effects. Yeah, metamisol. So yeah, yeah. We're talking about metamisol. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. May I also make a comment? So sure. in so in my center, we keen to use more opioids. So we are more relaxed to uh, to send uh, a kid home with opioids than paracetamol because we have the fear of uh, overseeing a fever in neutropenia. Yeah. So it just yeah again as I, as I said, part of the education to parents it's something that we, we say and it's written in uh, we have this booklet that we give to all, every new patient and it says, if you think that you need to give paracetamol for pain, please 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 check the body temperature, make sure that the child is not having other problems. Okay. And may, may I sure. ask one question to paracetamol? When we give it IV, it works very very well. Yeah. When we give very it fast. orally, yep. it does not work the same way. So paracetamol for sending home patients orally, my experience and there is of course yeah. a pathophysiological uh, a physiological explanation for that does not work the same way as it works IV. Yep. Um, of course, we are not giving uh, per rectum paracetamol to our patients, right? Nothing like that. But there is a new formulation, well, newish formulation, which is, which is effervescent 
um, paracetamol. And the, the kids actually like it a lot. And uh, the parents, what they tell us is that it works faster than the, the regular pill. I don't know if you have any experience with that. Uh, I have never taken it myself, so I just hear it <laughs> from them that they really like it. Yes, and yep. uh, we still have another case. Okay. So we have five minutes. Can I just mention one but it's okay. drug we would usually use here sure. uh, oh, sure. in, in Sweden is clonidine or catapresan. Oh, yeah. So we think that's typically we would have started with paracetamol and clonidine, maybe the opioid if we think the pain is really strong, but that's what we would step down to when we finish with the opioid as well. So we think it works quite well when, when you have a bit of neurogenic pain, uh, so in vincristine mm -hmm. it may be enough uh, sometimes, and then uh, then uh, also it's a bit of anxiolytic we find. So so yeah. we we use it quite a lot yeah. actually. Yeah, that's interesting because there isn't much about. I I, I don't. Last question. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, what do you do if a kid doesn't want to take anything orally? It happens a lot. They're very tiny. Well, and sometimes, sometimes they hate it does happen. For us. You meaning when when the kid is going home? Yeah. Yeah, or well. in general, like there, this route of access <laughs> is just unavailable for you. Well, wow, wow, wow. That 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 can be re really tricky, right? Especially when they have to take um, oral mercaptopurin or something like that, right? So it it can be quite tricky. So um, it's hard. <laughs> There's no simple uh, answer to. Uh, for that, because of course we can we can uh, use the transdermal uh, fentanyl patches, but we still need rescue medications, and there isn't much uh, on the way because we have transmucosal fentanyl, but then the dosing is too high for a small uh, kit, so we really only have the morphine um, drops, so we have to disguise it. Uh, in extreme cases, we may have to resort to a nasogastric tube, but it's also yeah, so it depends. Yeah, it's so it can be hard. Okay, this is going to be shorter, I promise. So, second case this is a 17 year old boy, uh, just arrived uh, from Africa in September 21 with a stage four uh, osteosarcoma. So, you can see the x ray. I didn't put up the CT scans because you don't need the CT scan to show that. So uh, he came um, very ill, uh, bedridden, cachetic. Uh, his pain was 10 out of 10. He came with his father. And uh, because this, this is incurable disease uh, and because he was in such severe pain, the, the decision was made to amputate uh, because it was really uh, what we could do. Uh, but uh, we started uh, palliative, um, palliative intent IV chemotherapy, and it did have a good 15 months um, of uh, good quality of life. He, he went, uh, uh, well, not home, but to, uh, of course, to, uh, to a foster home, and he had a quite good quality of life. But, of course, what happened was that the uh, lung disease uh, started to progress, and in April 23, um, he was already 18 years old. Uh, you can see the x-ray and he developed severe dyspnea. So how are we gonna deal with this? Already? <laughs> I can start to work. Oh my god. <laughs> that's like <laughs> that's like taking the escalator to to the to the balcony to the top floor. <laughs> to the sky. Yeah. I would start with morphine that I think it's good for for dynia. It's good for for them breathing. Yes, it is it is. Is it? Is morphine good for dyspnea? Yeah, low dose. Someone said low dose. Yes. So it's usually recommended half the dose. I of. was going to say the same. Morphine and maybe also benzodiazepine infusion. Okay. 
Maybe also benzodiazepine, okay. someone said. Yeah. Supportive care with oxygenation and maybe um, think about a transfusion in case that the patient has a low hemoglobin just to support the whole system. Yeah, okay. So, the first questions I think we should ask ourselves is, is there a reversible cause? Well, in this case, it could have uh, anemia, yes, maybe th this could help. Uh, is there an advanced care plan? Have we talked about this before with him and his uh, father? And don't forget that he's already 18, right? And if something was decided, uh, does that decision still hold? Because that, dis that discussion may have happened many months uh, ago when he was doing well, and sometimes people change their minds when they see themselves living the situation. So that this would be the first things. So uh, of course we can uh, intervene in uh, so many different ways. One of them is really improving airflow, you know, having a large room uh, with a good ventilation, uh, lowering the temperature of the room, uh, providing, uh, um, making sure that the, the air is not very dry, especially in the winter because we, we're using uh, heaters, right? Uh, loose clothes, a hand fan has been shown to be the most, one of the most effective ways to treat dyspnea, a hand fan, okay? You can look it up, there's a randomized trial. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Uh, and of course, we can, we can improve his uh, position in bed, right? We can sit him up because he's probably going to breathe easily if he's sitting up. Oxygen, someone mentioned oxygen, right? Yeah. So uh, is everyone going to feel better using oxygen? Not everyone. And sometimes the small kids, um, we will offer the oxygen to them and they will hate it, yeah. right? They will take it up. So you can try, again, it's an N of one, you can try, and if the person is feeling better, okay, you live it. If not, it's for us, not for, uh, not for the patient. Uh, of course, give support to the patient and the family, talk to them, explain what's going on, and that we are trying everything, and so on and so, and then drugs. So um, we can use, um, several uh, types of drugs, and you've said it all. You said, I think Marta said morphine, but half the analgesic dose. So we should use the, the rapid onset or ultra rapid onset formulation for this to control the dyspnea. Uh, yes, benzodiazepines, if there's a lot of anxiety, and they might be especially useful at night because at night uh, is when patients near the end of life and with severe dyspnea are most afraid to, to, to fall asleep because they, they, uh, they will be afraid that they will not wake up. So uh, an anxiolytic might be especially useful at night. Uh, steroids, again, we, we can try. And palliative sedation. So I, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but it's, it's okay, it's there, palliative sedation, yeah. So what is palliative sedation? It's using drugs to reduce the level of consciousness to alleviate or control severe refractory symptoms. It's not for everything, it's for severe refractory symptoms. It does imply obtaining informed consent from the patient if um, he, he has the capacity to understand what's happening and uh, or the patient's uh, family. What it is not, it's not the use of drugs to uh, anticipate or to cause death. Okay, so it's not euthanasia, it's nothing like that. And very importantly, it should also not be the use of drugs to alleviate the suffering of the family or of the healthcare professionals. And this is what most probably expa explains the differences in the, in the use of palliative sedation in different countries. Because uh, um, some countries, like 80% of the kids with cancer that die, uh, die under palliative sedation, and in others it's like 5%. So, I'm not, um, I don't uh, um, um, think that 
there is such a different level of suffering, it's probably our suffering that is different. So severe refractory symptoms. It means that they must be refractory to um, all the measures that we have tried. Okay, so we, we have tried everything else possible and nothing has worked or it's not, we don't have uh, a good enough uh, control of the, of the symptom. So we need to use palliative sedation. And these are the usual symptoms that you, we can um, treat with palliative sedation. You want to ask something? You have written uh, informed consent. I think we all agree on yep. that. How do you manage this in your institution? How do the others? Do you seek for a written informed consent in such a situation for palliative sedation? Or is it a con conversation that is documented in the patient chart? Yeah. How does it, is it managed in your institutions? And especially, of course, Anna and yours. Yeah. Well, the way we do it um, is, um, of course, a patient uh, like this would have uh, an advanced care plan uh, in place. And that plan, that one would be written, written, not signed. It was uh, deemed in our country not ethical to ask parents to sign, but they do get a copy. So if they do not agree with what is written, they will tell us. So the copies have to match, of course. And then when we come to palliative sedation, when we, we go to the, to the patient and our family to suggest using palliative sedation, it's as you said, it's a conversation. It's very important that it's not just the doctor that goes into this conversation. It's usually the doctor and the nurse or the doctor and the psychologist or two healthcare professionals. And then we document it uh, in the patient's chart. Yes, so I don't know how you do it. Yeah, everyone does it this way? Yeah, it looks to me the most uh, practical and um, simplest and nicest thing. So uh, we should really um, uh, look at these ethical guidelines. So severe refractory symptoms, a person who is approaching death but doesn't have to, to be uh, dying uh, we don't have to be certain that this, this person is going to die tomorrow. That's not the idea. Um, there should be a DNR order in place. Uh, we must obtain informed consent, uh, especially if we are not specialists ourselves and if we're not used to use it to, to, to utilize palliative sedation, we should get other specialists involved. And really, the intent is to ease suffering and not to hasten death. But uh, disclosure, it has happened to me that some families have said, please, please, please increase the, the, the rhythm because I can't take this anymore. But that's against the ethical principles. It, that's alleviating the family suffering and not the patient's uh, suffering. Sure. Oh. If the patient is not able to communicate, to, to say to you that he wants, um, that he needs something stronger, but you can easily say, see that he suffers, and the family as well. So they ask you to do something. This is not a communication of approving um, palliative, sedative. Uh, so you're, you're saying the, the, the patient and or the family ask us to do something. Yeah, like by the by asking you to increase the rate. Yep. So this is actually the meaning is that he suffered so much and we need to do something. No, no, no. What I was saying was uh, what has happened is the family asking to increase because they cannot take it anymore. They want it to end. Oh, okay, okay. So I, I'm sorry if, I, if, okay. if that no, wasn't clear. The patient is doing fine. No, the patient is stable. He's stable. Well, okay, not okay. doing fine. <laughs> Probably not doing fine, but okay. yes. Yeah, you ready for Kati? Yeah. No, the patient is stable, and it's the family because sometimes this process, the process of dying, can take two days, three days, a week, and sometimes families will say that. Will say, "I cannot take this anymore. Please end this." But that's euthanasia. That's not. No. That would be another talk. Uh, so there are two types of palliative sedation, and it can be light, and the patient is still able to communicate, but it's still enough to relieve uh, the symptom, in this case the dyspnea, and, or it can be deep. 
So we, we sedate the patient to the point of unconsciousness. So, and there's everything uh, in between. And there's also intermittent or continuous sedation. And so we can just sedate the patient uh, at night. That happens a lot, especially with uh, small kids, because they, they're feeling more or less okay during the day and they wanna play. And the family really, really enjoys that the, the kids are still playing and interacting with the siblings or, sorry, or um, whatever they want to do. And then at night, is, it's when it really becomes uh, uh, unbearable. So we have to distinguish. Uh, drugs, we can use several drugs for palliative sedation. The one that pedi pediatricians use the most, I'm going to say, is midazolam. Um, and here, sorry, this on this side, uh, there are drugs that we will most probably need the help from our friends in pain and the specialized palliative care, uh, anesthesia, and some things, some, some uh, things like that, because we are not used and it, they're a little bit more tricky to 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 use. Dexmedetomidine is one of the newest kids on the block, and it seems to be especially useful at the end of life because it also has analgesic, uh, an analgesic effect, so it's, it's, it's growing. But let's um, focus on midazolam a little later. So again, there are several ways that we can do uh, this palliative sedation. It will depend on the, on the setting and on the resources and uh, if the child has or doesn't have a, a line uh, in place. What we should not forget is to think of all the other medications that the, this patient is probably um, also taking, especially if they have um, other uh, CNS effects uh, as well. And don't forget that sometimes these patients will also be under uh, morphine, continuous IV morphine, that also has a sedative effect. But we should not be using morphine for sedation. That's also a common uh, mistake that people make, that morphine sedates, well, it does sedate, but not to the point of palliative sedation. For that, we should use midazolam. So uh, we all know uh, midazolam, it does have a very short half-life. It can be given through several um, um, routes, and each of them has uh, uh, different uh, uh, dosings. And so in this situation, for palliative sedation at the end of life, uh, I think we should really prefer continuous IV or sub-Q because the patient may not have an IV line. So you can use um, uh, sub-Q routes and uh, nursing is very good at that. And so we start with boluses again, like we spoke about with the continuous IV morphine. And then we have the infusion, we start low. Don't forget also to prescribe SOS because there might be periods of agitation or intensified dyspnea, and so we need also the SOS. And we should review frequently uh, for uh, the striking the balance between the effect and, uh, and the uh, adverse events. So, last slide. What are we gonna do with this 18 year old who weighs 50 kilos and has a pick line? So he comes, he was home and he came to hospital feeling really um, uh, sick, severe dyspnea, and we, we take the x-ray and this is his x-ray. So what are we gonna do? Talk to the patient. You saw my slides, right? Yeah. <laughs> Talk to the patient. Yeah, absolutely. What else? <laughs> yeah, give him a hand fan. Good. We can take the, the fans that are over there. There's a randomized trial, I tell you. Ask. We yeah. will discuss with him how much he wants to be to stay conscious or how much he wants to not stay conscious. Because in our center, sometimes we propose a patient control sedation with a benzodiazepine. Yeah. So he can choose whether he mm -hmm. wants to be or and when yeah. he wants to switch off or switch on. Yeah, that, that comes to the choice of between light and, and deep sedation too. Yes? No. Yes, so yeah. So uh, there's a decision to be made there too, right? Is he going to go home? Does he want to go home? 
Does he want to stay in the hospital? Do we think that he can go home safely? What kind of a palliative care system you have? Do you have a nurses that can go visit him at home uh, regularly? I mean, this has we been discussed, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, this boy had an advanced care plan. And uh, the way it works in our institute, we have a palliative care team within the pediatric oncology, but we do not have the uh, possibility to go home, to, to, to do home care. What we do is we work with the primary care, uh, home care teams, and we work with them. But because he was not a Portuguese citizen, he could not uh, uh, use that service. So if he were to go home, he would be on his own. But that's a good point. We have to discuss what he wants and if it's possible, if he wants to go home, what is possible. And as we mentioned earlier, perhaps looking for uh, possible reversible causes, um, presence of infection, perhaps if there's an element of underlying infection, which yeah, you might so need to yeah. treat, which might yeah, help no, the symptoms. There was, well. there was no fever, there was no, nothing. No. Yeah. I'm sorry, we're way over time. Sorry. I just wanted to um, gauge like how this sort of practice differs across Europe, because in the UK we wouldn't it, we wouldn't take this approach to palliative sedation. There is a principle whereby we would. Um, so there's an ethical principle known as the double effect, whereby we would potentially use analgesia and sedation in patients in this situation to help keep them comfortable, which is a good effect, but it has the double effect of also having the bad effects of potentially hastening their death. But we wouldn't start it with the intention, like you said, of hastening death, and we wouldn't take consent. We wouldn't give it with the intention of sedating them, but just to keep them comfortable. Um, so I just wondered what, what other countries... Yeah, but that, that's what I said uh, maybe 10 minutes ago, that there is a wide range of uh, use of palliative sedation with, within Europe. And uh, UK is like one of the countries where you use it uh, the lowest, at the lowest rate. Yeah. We, we, so wouldn't, we wouldn't call it that. Yeah. Well, well, no, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's wrong. Sorry, I, sorry, I'm not I, saying I, it's wrong. I'm I, saying, just saying it's different. The, the north of, of England is, yeah. is a different country than the south of England, as, <laughs> okay. as we worked out earlier today. And they're surprised that we have running water and electricity. Oh. Um, I, I think we do this, but we don't express it. Okay. We don't talk about it being sedative. We all bung up morphine and das subcut infusions. We use it all the time to take away the anxiety, to make people feel better. But if you told us that we were sedating them at the end of life, then we'd go, oh, we don't do that in the UK. Yeah. And, and it's a... It, it's not using those words, but it's exactly what we do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was just reading about it because it's interesting to hear it described in these terms because we, and apparently in some countries, I don't know if this is true, but you would get relatives round to say goodbye before they were sedated. I don't know if that's something which is a practice yeah, well, or not. That's, that's, but we thanks for pointing we would, that out because we, that's we one of the that. important things. It's that um, when you sedate someone with the intention of controlling symptoms, people people, uh, so the patients and the family, need to understand that if you go for a deep or a deeper sedation, that might be the time to say goodbye because the patient will not be waking up again, right? So that's why, to me, it's no, <laughs> no, uh, no problem. We do need to have informed consent. I would not dream of starting this without getting informed consent. Yeah, no, we don't consent for anything like that, do we? You don't, do you? No, you don't get consent. You don't get written I consent. I don't know. You're no, no, we don't get written consent. Yeah, yeah. No, do don't get written consent. <laughs> do get consent. Don't just go, hang on, slip it in quick. Um, yeah. But, but even like, but to be honest, though, we would, we'd say, oh, we're going to keep them comfortable. We might yeah. use escalating doses. But we wouldn't, we wouldn't even say, is that okay? We'd, we'd just say we're going to manage their symptoms, probably. Uh, and probably. and with, with older kids, I 
would definitely get into a discussion around, well, we can increase that. That will mean you're less likely to be awake. Mm -hmm. What we could do is change it a little bit during the daytime so that then yeah. it might be more uncomfortable, but you're more awake. And then at night time, yeah. maybe we okay. up that a bit and you have an extra dose. And, and it's that discursive thing. Um, but hearing it described this way, I think, is quite unnerving. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Culturally <laughs> unnerving. Okay, so maybe we should close. So uh, what we did was, as was uh, suggested, of course, we sat and we spoke uh, again with him and his father, and we said, of course, it's, we're probably we're coming to uh, an end. So what do we what do you want to do? In the meantime, while we were talking, uh, he was given an oxygen mask to try on, and he really liked it. So uh, we decided. So he could not go home with the oxygen. There was no chance of that happening. So we decided that he was going to be uh, admitted. Uh, so admission with minimal IV fluids, which is also important in this uh, situation, of course, not to, uh, in, in, uh, to uh, um, aggravate his dyspnea with, uh, with fluid uh, overload. Uh, oral morphine, as we said before, uh, half the analgesic dose. And the decision was with him to go for light intermittent sedation. This boy uh, was a Muslim. And he really wanted to be uh, awake during the day to do his five, I think it's five, daily prayers, right? So uh, we went for IV midazolam from 10 p.m. to early morning. Um, and so boluses, um, the continuous infusion, the dose had to be increased every few days. And then just uh, the day before he died, uh, which was two, two uh, weeks later, uh, we had to change it to continuous and a little deeper, but that's the way it went. So I'm sorry that it took us 20 minutes over <laughs> the time, but I think it was interesting discussion. And please take a look at the group's uh, webpage uh, on SIOP and apply to become a member and help us spread the word. Thank you. Thank you.